Well, thank you, John, for inviting me on behalf of the uh, Blacktown chapter of the Full Gospel Businessmen. Um, I, I am a member of the chapter. Of, I belong to the Parramatta one. And so I'm very pleased to be here and to support all that you're doing uh, through this particular organisation. And it's great too to see Gary here, who's an old friend of mine. And uh, we even talked into being a candidate on one occasion. Loved it. <laughs> He'd be a great member of parliament someday. <laughs> so I've just come from parliament with um, some of the organisation that we, I'm involved in and today was the deadline for putting together our newspaper, the Family World News. Uh, every month we print this newspaper, so it's, I call it my baby, um, in putting together what I believe what God puts into my heart uh, to share with other people. So I feel very happy because the baby was born today. Uh, I finished the paper, it's now the printer. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so, I am pleased to be here too because John was giving me a lot of help and encouragement during the illness of my wife, uh, Elaine, uh, who went to be with the Lord on the 17th of October uh, last year. But she was a, a wonderful Christian and a far better Christian than me, although I sometimes think women are closer to God than men. I'm not sure why, it's whether because they have babies or something, but I, I think there's something spiritual about women. We men have to work at it. Uh, but I think for women it's sometimes comes a bit naturally and I know in my wife's case she was a wonderful Christian lady and for three years she fought the cancer and uh, did everything the doctor said uh, should be done perhaps it might help to beat it with uh, about three times going through chemotherapy going through radiation injecting radiation isotopes into her body which is very unusual it's a, an experiment which was a complete failure so I don't recommend it to you if anyone suggests it to you. Maybe they'll get it, improve it in due course. Even to have an operation, a specialist said, look, I think I can cut the tumours out of the liver. So I'll have this operation and they cut my wife. And when I saw her after the operation, uh, it was like a heart transplant. They'd cut it right down here, right across there and sort of pull the liver out. Uh, but the specialist told me after the operation, he said it was, the tumours had grown so large if we had to cut them out, there'd be nothing left. There'd be no liver, so she would have died on the operating table. So I was very sad when my wife, uh, after all the pain and agony of going through the operation, opened her eyes and she said, Fred, was it successful? And I had to say, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't. There was another disappointment. We had a lot of those over the three years. And uh, <clears throat> after that radiation treatment, we thought that might be successful. And when the specialist said, no, it's a failure, but nothing more can be done and said to both of us uh, just put your wife into a palliative care and just let her die and that's pretty demoralising when that someone says that to you when you've been looking to them over those years the same specialist and uh, Elaine was very hurt she said I just felt like he just threw me away and uh, nothing more could be done and uh, we had both had a lot of tears that day and uh, we went down from the surgery to the dining room and she said, I'll just have a cup of coffee or something to help me get over this. And while we were there, Brad Hazard, a member of Parliament, a minister in the government, was there with his wife, who's a doctor. And they saw that we were very distressed and came over and it was very nice. His wife gave us a lot of comfort and encouragement on that occasion. But three years before that, uh, when the... Elaine's GP diagnosed the cancer and said uh, you'll have to go straight to emergency at St Vincent's Hospital and get an ambulance to take her up there straight away. And when we got up there they did tests and, and the specialist, Elaine's very practical lady, and she said, well, how long do I have to live? And the specialist said after these initial tests, six days, he said, just like that. <laughs> perhaps a bit longer if we give you some treatment. So that was the first big shock we had. We had a few tears after that too. You don't like to hear that uh, verdict. But I still thank the Lord as we prayed together every day and I spent time with Elaine at the hospital. 
I was able to be with her right at that very moment, the very second. In fact, uh, as the Bible verse talks about in the twinkling of an eye, and that one second she was here with me, the next second she was with the Lord. Amen. And as I prayed with Elaine, and they told me she's very close to dying, and Elaine knew that, and I said, uh, as I pray to Elaine, you can see me now, Elaine, but shortly you're going to open your eyes up and you'll see Jesus Christ. Yes, so the next person to see will be Jesus. And she said, yes, I know, I know that. And she had absolute confidence that she'd be in the Lord's presence. So we always prayed. Uh, the final prayer was, after praying for healing and all the other things you pray for, we always pray that your will be done. We wanted your will to be done, Lord. If you want Elaine to be with you in glory, you've got a special purpose for her there. You need an extra angel. Uh, so be it. We're not going to be critical or lack faith and trust in you that our lives are absolutely in your hands. So Elaine was a wonderful blessing to me and strength, and we spent nearly 15 years in Parliament together, which is very unusual to be a, a husband and wife team. And... Uh, we would actually not just talk about marriage and family life, we demonstrated it. We, we uh, had to reveal it, if you like, in a very cynical place where not many of the marriages are very successful and politicians get involved with various affairs and so on, as you know. And uh, we, we just believe that God gave us that special opportunity to actually witness by our own presence in the Parliament to the importance of marriage and, and family life. So it was a great privilege that God allowed us to do that. It's very unusual for a husband and wife both to be in Parliament uh, together. And uh, I'm glad when they, I was first elected, they built a special seat for me because the Labor government was in power and uh, they were very angry that I'd got elected. So they wouldn't give me a seat and they wouldn't give me an office. But eventually the carpenters came in and they built the seat and the word around Parliament was this. They said, what are they building in, in the chamber? Oh, they're building Fred Niles' pulpit. <laughs> and uh, they meant it as a joke. But I said, Amen, that is my pulpit. You don't know what you're going to get. And I get the word of the Lord. Every opportunity I had and every time I was speaking to bring in God's word uh, from, the, from the Bible. Because Eli and I, as evangelicals, as Bible-believing Christians, we believe the Bible is literally the word of God. And Jesus Christ is the living word of God. And those two truths we hang on to. Also that we believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and shed his precious blood to wash away our sins. That we, through faith in him, asking for forgiveness and accepting him as our saviour, we become as white as snow, as white as wool. We're all sinners, saved by grace. And I'm very, I'm very much aware of that. That I'm only here by the grace of God in everything that I've been able to achieve is only through God's grace and God's goodness. Amen. We were chatting at the table earlier and I think Paul asked me where, where did I start off from in King's Cross, which is true. Uh, my father was a cab driver and my mother was a waitress. And um, he'd go to this cafe and have his lunch each day and, and my, wife, my mother told me later, she said, I thought he had his eye on me. Uh, but he was very shy, so it went on for some months before he actually said anything. But eventually he made some remarks and they started going together and they got married and I was their first son. So I'm very much the son of a King's Cross taxi driver. <laughs> but I, I really believe though, as it says in Jeremiah, that God knows us from the womb and we believe that God gives that gift of life from the womb. That's why I'm absolutely opposed to abortion because there is a real person there in the womb. That's right. They're not out of the womb yet, they're not born, but they're there. That's another gift of life from God. And uh, I've always had that sense, when I, after I came to know Christ as my saviour, that that was how God planned my life, that somehow I was meant to come back to King's Cross and to bring the gospel and to do all I could to clean up King's Cross, to fight all the corruption, the sin, the vice, and so on. And not in my strength, in God's strength. Because I'm actually a very, uh, everybody who knows me closely, uh, so I don't know how you do this, Fred, because you're a very shy person. I am. But God's sort of said, I'll give you the strength, I'll give you the courage, 
just do my will and I'll put you in the front line, but I'll be there right with you, not way back. I'll be Christ to be right next to you in that, in that battle. So I thank the Lord after coming out of that non-Christian environment. And my father was an unusual person. Uh, he always carried a, a pistol, even after he sold the cab and bought a, a mixed business, which is like a, an old-fashioned 7-Eleven in the old days. They called him a mixed business. And even there, that became the local SP bookies place for bringing all the bets. And I used to be the bookies runner, carrying the bets from the shop up to the main bookie and the mascot. <clears throat> he was like a Mr. Big. Uh, and everybody used to say, ever get in trouble with the police? See this guy. He, he can fix it for you. And he did. He was like the unofficial mayor. Uh, he must have had contacts with police officers and politicians and so on. And so uh, I, I had no concept I was doing anything wrong. Uh, I never thought about being illegal and so on. I, I certainly knew that later when I came to Christ. But that was the environment that I was in and my parents moved to Reesby and uh, had a, a house there and a big new development that had been previously market gardens and farms. And thousands of people moved out to Reesby, a bit like happened with Penrith later. And so Reesby became this new sub suburb and shopping centre and so on with the railway line. And uh, my mother said, you ought to get involved with some of the young people out here because we'd obviously been with young people where we lived, but now we're completely alone in a new suburb. And uh, even though my parents didn't go to church, they didn't profess any faith in God, but my mother, my mother had a little uh, a seed of it, I believe. And um, although I still remember when I became a minister and I told my mother I thought she'd be proud, she said, Oh, Fred, I do wish you'd become a proper minister. <laughs> <laughs> she had an Anglican background, so and any proper minister was an Anglican clergyman. So she never believed I was a proper minister, being a Protestant, but no, I, I'm a proper minister. <laughs> but she was still proud of me. So she suggested I should go up to the church, because a lot of young people were playing on the tennis court up there, and I went up there and had a look at it. I saw all these very uh, nice young ladies playing tennis. And I thought, gee, I'd like to get to know them. And uh, so I went up to the people in running it and I said, could I uh, join this tennis club? They said, yes, but this tennis club belongs to the Reesby Evangelical Congregational Church. And if you join the tennis club, you have to go to church at least once a Sunday. Not most of us go on Sunday nights. And I thought, well, that's not too big a price to pay <laughs> to meet the girls. And of course, uh, one, of them, one of them became a wife, Elaine, and that's going way back to 1952 when I first saw her and she was, they always told me, and, I, and it was dead right, they said she's the prettiest girl in the whole group. So I married the prettiest one. And, um, and so I was obviously attracted to Elaine and we started going together for a couple of years. Uh, but I was talking to a mother, her mother, who's my mother-in-law, and she told me a little story, she said, uh, you hadn't been going up to that church very long, she said, before Elaine came home. And she said, all she talked about was this, this boy, Fred. <laughs> so I think I had my eyes on Elaine, but I think she had eyes, her eyes on me too. So uh, I was pleased to hear that. So I started attending the church, and I didn't know I'd walked into a sort of Billy Graham-style church where the old-fashioned pastor, Simon Buttle, he'd preach for, uh, in the mornings on... Uh, building up the Christians and the Bible teaching and so on. But at night, he'd give a sermon, a Bible teaching again, but he'd always have an appeal for the gospel, like full gospel businessman. It was always preaching for a commitment. And he, he wouldn't just make an appeal once a month. Every night, he'd make an appeal. Every time he preached, he made a, an appeal for people to come to accept Christ as their saviour. And so that was a bit of a shock to me when I first went to the church that night, sitting in the back seat, trying to be, keep out of the way of everybody, all these religious people. And uh, <clears throat> I realised I'm in trouble because this guy, through his preaching, or through the power of the Holy Spirit, was like a big sledgehammer hitting a, a, a large piece of concrete. And that was my heart. And uh, God must have known it's going to take a while to get Fred Noel on the right track. So I'm going to pound him Sunday night after Sunday night. <laughs> after Sunday night. 
So after about six months of that preaching, that concrete cracked. And uh, he said, anyone tonight who wants to accept Christ as their saviour and believes him as their saviour and wants forgiveness through the blood of Christ, would they stand up and let me know? And so I stood up and uh, that night I accepted Christ as my saviour. And I thank the Lord for that. I was about 17 or 18 at that stage. Now I didn't know as a young man I, I was just going to say that was the most important decision I made in my life and probably it is. The other one is who you're going to marry. But I didn't realise that decision was like an earthquake. That decision then put me in the centre of God's plan for my life. And my whole life was then going in a direction that God had planned. If I hadn't made that decision I would have gone off the rails, I'm sure of that. Uh, because that very night I was with my brother who's just uh, a bit younger than me and, uh, and the pastor as he was counselling me said to my brother who was standing with me and what about you Jim if you uh, made a decision tonight and my brother said no I don't, I don't want to become a Christian and he said and, and it hurt me hurt the pastor he said this will be the last time I go to church so he just walked out and he went on a different pathway so that night God opened up the pathway to glory for me and he went down the broad way in the other direction and uh, I love my brother and I witness to him regularly and I visit him and do all I can to help him but he's a uh, you see all the poker machines here well he's a director and treasurer of the Bankstown Trotting Club and uh, his my proudest achievement is leading someone to Christ his proudest achievement is putting in $2 million worth of poker machines in the club. And he'll ring me up and say, look Fred, I want you to come over to the club. I'll, I'll have to show you what I've <clears throat> done the last week. We've installed all these new poker machines. And he is so proud. It's, it's an achievement. And uh, he's made the club successful and making a profit. And uh, he gets re-elected every election. In fact, he just told me, I was just with him at Christmas. He said, uh, for the first time, he said, Fred, in this election, there were no other candidates for director treasurer. So not, in, not out of 20,000 people, not one person stood against me. And it's the first time it's ever happened. So he said, they're all very happy with me. But that's his life. Yes. And, uh, and I thought perhaps I would have gone the same way with him. Or maybe gone back to King's Cross. Because I, I have a gift of organising. I thought maybe if I didn't come to Christ, I would be now organising um, strip clubs or gambling places or porn places up in King's Cross for the devil. But the devil plucked me out of hell and put me on the pathway to be his servant. Now I still didn't know what it meant uh, as far as my future life was concerned. I, I had a job. I, I wasn't um, very ambitious when I left school. After going through, and we both had some connection with Crown Street School, Cleveland Street School. And uh, I just wanted to get any job. I just wanted to get money. Uh, I was just, uh, this is before I became a Christian, I was just materialistic. And I said in this uh, employment agency, the Commonwealth Employment Agency, we've got a job for a, a junior storeman at the airport. I thought, well, that sounds terrific, you know, aeroplanes and so on. But I was just a storeman, junior storeman, and you're the, you're the labourer. <laughs> You, you sweep the factory out in the morning, you carry stuff for the, for the storemen who are doing things, packing things, you, you help them, you're their assistant. So I had no career, I was going nowhere. But it's amazing, after I come to know Christ, my whole attitude changed, my whole life changed. It wasn't very long before the manager called me and I said, I want to make you, <coughs> uh, put you into the office now in charge of purchasing all the stuff you've been packing. You can be now the purchasing officer for the company and I said that's, that's wonderful and then they made me assistant manager and so on. So I was, I was going in a career of business and I thought well, that's probably where I'm going to go. And uh, even though I, I'd come to know Christ, I'd use my skills to serve him, witness for him in the office as I did. I regard him as a bit of a fanatic. I'd be going around the office and giving everybody tracks uh, to get them to come to know Christ as their saviour. So I got a bit of a reputation for that. But, and then Elaine got a job in the same office, so we both were there, uh, witnessing for Christ in that office, Paul and Gray, uh, down in Sussex Street, Sydney. 
So I got involved with church work, obviously, and I really went flat out with church work and probably overdid it to some extent. I was running uh, two, two uh, CE groups, one at the Roosby Church, one at the Panania Church, and they, I heard that they were short of a youth leader at the Newtown Church, so I volunteered here to do that as well. Uh, on a Tuesday night, so I'd go down there and run a club for about 60 boys uh, in, the, in the main uh, shopping centre of Newtown. I got involved with Christian Endeavour and I was, enjoyed that very much. Elaine and I were both members of the CE group, which is like a Bible study group where everybody takes part every week and that helps to develop your leadership abilities and so on. But then a major change came in my life in uh, January 1990. Uh, 1955 when I was just going on to 22 and it was a, a remarkable event where I was at a meeting and John Ridley was a preacher uh, he was a very wonderful evangelist uh, he's the man that sowed the seeds in the mind of the guy who wrote Eternity on the on the footpaths or well, the man that was preaching was John Ridley and he responded to that while well, I was responding as well to this was a call from John really to give your life <clears throat> to Christ, to serve him full time. <clears throat> and so I didn't want to do that because I was very comfortable and getting a good wage. But again, a bit like that concrete again, uh, God kept hitting me as he kept preaching saying, I want you, Fred, this is, and this is the most important moment in your life what you do now in the next few minutes, the decision you make. And I said, Lord, just as if the Lord was actually standing in front of me talking to me, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll do anything for you. I want to serve you. I'm serving you in youth work, Sunday school work and so on. I said, what do you, what do you want me to do, Lord? And it was as if the Lord was actually talking to me and I could hear these words. I want you to die for me. I said, die for you? No, I don't want to die for you. I want to live for you. No, are you willing to die for me? And I had no idea what it meant. And I had to wrestle a bit like Job, I suppose, with God, would I give my life? And to me, it sounded like I was going to die fairly quickly. It wouldn't be like in 50 years' time. But somewhere, somehow, I'd be... I thought a flash went through my mind, maybe I'm going to be a missionary in... I'm going to be speared to death by wild natives in South America or something like that next year. And so finally I, I weighed it up and I said, Lord, if you want me to die for you, I, I'm willing to die for you. Whatever you want for me, I'm willing to do. If, if you want my life, you've got my life. Now I had no idea what it all meant. I now know what it meant. Because what God was putting into my heart and the way he's led my life was I want you to take this word of God, this, the Bible and I want you to be faithful to that not just in the pulpit in the church I want you to be faithful to this word of God right in the middle of society right in the middle of the marketplace right in the middle of a TV station right in the middle of a radio station in front of a newspaper editor I want you to be faithful when people are saying we don't know what's right, what's wrong we don't know what direction to go I want you to be faithful to that word so you can say, thus said the Lord. Not Fred Nile. Fred Nile is quoting the word. So it's not the gospel according to Fred Nile. It's the gospel according to Christ. Amen. It's the word of God. Amen. And I want you to stand firm. So as I reveal to you my truth from my word, I don't want you just to bury that. I want you to put it out there. And, and, and that's how God's led my life. And I accepted that as a special call from the Lord. And the ones that he calls, he will enable. And so in a very simple way, when people would want to legalise pornography or legalise abortions, uh, or even now today, same-sex marriages, and they'd say, what do you think about this, Fred? I'd say, I'm totally opposed to that. Why? Because of what God's word says. Amen. And because I took such a strong stand, every, everybody would say, the homosexual would say, who is our main opponent? Fred Nile. The abortionists would say, who's our main opponent? Fred Nile. The porn peddlers, who's our main opponent? Fred Nile. So we've got to get him. Uh, threaten him, intimidate him, uh, whatever you like, and even in more recent days, even 
the Muslims because I've had a strong conviction that Islam is a real threat to our Christian faith, our Christian heritage. And I'm probably the only minister in the, uh, <coughs> only member of parliament who's ever spoken a critical word of Islam in speaking about what's happening in Nigeria where Christians are being massacred or in Iraq and so on. But most politicians just want to be friends with everybody. I say, you've got to speak the truth. You have to speak the truth. And we have to speak up on behalf of Christians who are dying for their faith. We can't be silent. Yeah, right. So I've taken that stand without wanting to push myself to be in the public limelight. Just do the Lord's work. And so over the years, I've had everything from bomb threats, uh, people ringing me on the phone. I've had notes put in my windscreen, wipers saying there's a bomb in your car. I've had stuff put under my door at home and all of that. I've had the Mardi Gras parade where they carried my head on the plate uh, and said, we want your head like John the Baptist. And they'd be chanting, we want Fred Nile's head, we want Fred Nile dead. And to have 2,000 homosexuals outside a apartment house chanting that in the full uh, blown voices so you couldn't miss it. Uh, we want Fred Nile's head. And it does put a little bit of human fear into you. And they say, well, Lord, you've called me. And, and I did say, I'm willing to die for you. Amen. So if someone wants to have a go at me, uh, I know I'm, my life's in your hands and no one can touch me unless it's part of your plan for my life. So I have, I have no fear. Of, uh... So I made a commitment to the Lord under that covering. Whatever challenges came or what invitations came, I would accept all of them. And uh, people said to me, you're a fool, Fred Noah, for going up to Oxford Street to debate with homosexuals at their invitation or to go to university uh, to be confronted with a couple of hundred students or to go to even the Atheist Society, they call the Humanist Society down Chippendale. They sort of said, we want you to come down and, and uh, we want to confront you, but you won't come, will you? Yeah, I will come. What, what time? What day? And I arrived and uh, they advertised I was coming and the place was packed and there were people hanging through the windows and everywhere. We're going to have a go at Fred Nile tonight. And uh, just before I came onto the platform to speak, they started a chant and sort of stamping their feet saying, send in the Christians, send in the Christians. <laughs> it was just like the lion's den in the early days of the church when the Christians were sent in the lion's den in the Colosseum to die for their faith. And I just walked in and, uh, and I just said, Lord, give me courage. So I, I had taken a whole lot of tracks with me about the gospel and putting your faith in Christ. And, and I was talking probably two under the most uh, hard-bitten atheists in Sydney. And so I, I, I said, I'm happy to come, but I want an agreement that I can speak without being interjected all the time. And I'll speak for an hour and then I'll answer questions for an hour. And, and, uh, and I didn't tell them this, but in that hour for questions, I got out, out, up out of my seat. I went through the whole hall distributing my tracks mm -hmm. to everywhere in the hall. I said, I'm going to come back at you and, and sow the seed of the Lord, the word of the Lord yes. with you. I'm not here to get browbeaten. I'm here to win and to win some of you for Christ, which I did. But the marvellous thing that night as I was debating every issue, and, and I hadn't con consciously thought of this, but on every issue, I, God gave me a scripture. And after I'd argued all the human arguments, what was wrong with this thing, I then say, but the word of the Lord says this. And you know, a, a quietness would come over the place. A, a quiet, a, it would just go very quiet. As if, even though they're atheists, they somehow recognised that was the word of the Lord. And the quietness came over it. And then they say, well, what about this issue? Then they switch to another argument on another issue. And I, and I just saw how powerful the word of God was in that environment. And that as we have that promise that his word will never return void, we will accomplish that for which it was meant to. And so I, I pray that some of those portions of the word of God did bear fruit in their lives. And I know over the years that's happened. The people that have come to me and letters I've had from people have said, I've written letters to you, cursing you, vilifying you, but I've come to know Christ as my saviour now, Fred, 
I just want you to forgive me. I don't even know who they are. And they write me these lovely letters. Just forgive me, Fred, for the things I've said about you. Uh, because now I love you. Because uh, I've come to know Christ and I understand what you were trying to say. So I thank the Lord for that. Well, the other miracle, of course, <coughs> taking me to Junior Storman, I finish up in Parliament. That's another miracle. So God wanted me to fight for his word and his truth right in the heart of government. I don't want you to be outside Fred knocking on the door. I want you right inside the place and I'm going to work a miracle to put you there. And, and you'd all know how difficult it is to win seats in Parliament. All the members in Parliament usually are from major parties with the whole backing of the Labor Party, Liberal Party, National Party. In my case, it was just Fred Nile and the Lord. And people said, you ought to stand for Parliament. So I put my name in as a candidate. And um, Elaine and I, on that particular day of that election in 1981, we travelled around visiting polling booths and we both talking to each other said, well, that's the last time we'll do that. We felt a bit disappointed. <clears throat> we hadn't met many, very many enthusiastic people. And so <clears throat> we went home that night and all was quiet. And uh, we both agreed that I wouldn't stand against a candidate. We'd seek the Lord's guidance and what more he wanted me to do. And the phone rang and, and it was Malcolm uh, ringing up one of the uh, researchers for the um, polling and he said uh, Fred you've been elected to Parliament I said, I said this is only about half past eight they only start counting the votes at eight o'clock he said no you're getting there's 300,000 votes have been counted and you've got 10% of them and usually with the way these things work it won't change they'll keep counting for another week or so 3 million votes and it was exactly the same figure 9.2% and so I nearly won two seats in that first election. I was not part of a party. All I had in the, on the ballot paper was my name. And God must have put a big searchlight on that name uh, that everybody responded on that occasion. And we thank the Lord for that. But I had a big debate over that because I hadn't planned to actually go into Parliament. It's one thing to be a candidate, nothing to be in Parliament. And I did a lot of heart searching and I had to search the word of God and one scripture that came home to me very strongly was in Romans chapter 13 verse 4 where it says there the government is to promote good and prevent evil and why? and the apostle Paul puts this twice in one verse in verse, verse 4 of chapter 13 the government is a minister of God and it had never registered with me before probably never. you probably read those words and it didn't click the government is a minister of God the government. And I believe because of that scripture, God was saying to me, I want godly men and women in government. I want Christians in government. I want men and women who will pray every day, your will be done. We're here to govern under your authority, under your sovereign power. That's God's plan. I believe that's God's plan from creation. That men and women of authority who were put there by the Lord would be his servants in governing the people. So that God, I know it sounds simple, that God in heaven would be governing the earth through human beings who love him and are obedient to his will. And he would actually be governing Blacktown and governing Blacktown City through the council, through men and women who love him. Governing the state of New South Wales through men and women who love him. Governing the nation of Australia. Governing all the nations. And it's amazing, you know, just a thought just came to me then. You know, that's what the Muslims believe. Allah is sovereign. And they'll do anything for Allah, even kill you for Allah. And I think it's time that we Christians claim government in the name of Christ and say Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Not just over the pulpit, not just over a four, four walls of a church building, but over our cities and over our nation and over this planet yes. and Christians need to have courage to claim that in the name of the Lord so that's what God's put into my heart for the 31 years I've been in Parliament now, preaching my heart out having lots of victories having some defeats but you, as, as the Apostle Paul said you get battered and bruised, you're down on the mat bleeding the big thing is, well you get up again you get up again, back into the fight 
Amen. That's what I've done. But God's given us victories. We've had wonderful conversions in Parliament. People like Frank Arena, a hard-bitten Labor member, an atheist, who one day came to me in a great shock to me, saying, Fred, will you pray to Jesus for me? Would you pray? She just had a great need. And out of all the people there, I was the one she came to. But just to know, let you know how politics works, I didn't know how sovereign God was in that situation with Frank Arena. Not only did he change her spiritually, but he changed her attitude to issues. She was also pro-homosexual, pro-marijuana. Uh, she was secretary of the Republican movement and so on. All the things that I was opposed to. And they put a bill up in the, in the government, the Labor government put a bill up to legalise, grow your own marijuana. You could grow ten plants each. And you don't have to be a genius to work out, this is going to be a disaster. How can the police control illegal drugs if you can legally grow 10? Just get 10 mates and you'll grow 10 plants each. You've got a little plantation. And the police come and say, look, that's, he's growing those 10, I'm growing those 10. Uh, to me, it was just crazy. So I fought it with all, every ounce of effort. But they told me the parliament is evenly divided. It's like 21-20. It's going to get carried. And uh, Frank Arena said to me, Fred, what, do you, what should I do? She said, for 17 years, the Labor Party has told me how to vote. I don't have to think. They tell me, sit there, sit there, sit that side, sit that side for the vote. I obey them. She said, now I've been expelled from the Labor Party because she followed me completely and they expelled her. She said, now what do I do? I want you to tell me what to do. And, and that was a challenge to me then. I said, well, look, Franca, I want you to pray and seek God's will. I don't want you to make, have me take the place of the ALP. You've got to have your own conscience. You've got to make your own decisions. But I'll give you advice. I'll give you help. But I, I still want you to make your own decisions. And so she said, OK. She said, well, I, I don't want to vote for that marijuana bill now. I was going to vote for it, she said. And I said, well, that's wonderful. I hadn't told her not to vote for it, but she told me she wasn't going to vote for it. I said, great. Don't tell anyone else you're not going to vote for it because they're adding up all the names and your names is on the side of the yeses. They're counting on your vote. If they know you're going to change your vote, they'll rip into you before the vote, they'll do all they can to change your vote, they'll threaten you and so on. So I said, keep it as a surprise. Just wait for the last minute, just as they start to count the votes, just come in and sit in the chamber with me. So everybody's sitting there very quiet, having this division. They divide the parliament for a, a serious vote. They ring the bells for five minutes so everybody can come in for the vote, so no member's absent. And they're all looking around. It's almost like 20, 20. And then Frank Arena comes in. And they all expect her to walk and sit with the ALP and, and the Greens and vote for the marijuana. She came and sat next to me. Oh, and we defeated that bill by 21 votes to 20. Oh, Her vote gave us a victory. So I believe God had planned the whole thing. Yeah, thank you, he had it all under control. Don't worry, Fred. That's right. It's all under control. He gave us the extra vote. That's happened a number of times now in the Parliament in those years, those 31 years. I know one occasion, Elam was very ill, and uh, we used to stay in the hotel just near the Parliament. And uh, I said, we're having a vote on the uh, law and the age of consent. And I said to Elaine, well, I'm going to need your vote. So if, can you please get out of bed? I know you're ill and just be here for that vote. So she struggled over and it gave us another 21 to 20 and we defeated that bill on that occasion. So Elam, Elam was very faithful. She had a number of other health problems as well as the cancer. She had lung problems. So the Lord confirmed those words. The government is a minister of God. So it's been a great privilege. I've broken all the records. They say to me, Fred, you're the father of the house. I say, I'm the grandfather now. <laughs> After 31 years, no one's been there longer. But we're having battles. I've just come from Parliament now and I've just been battling uh, over the same-sex marriage. And I've got some of these pamphlets here about it, just explaining. I know you all believe it's wrong. Uh, but it just gives you some ideas what to do and how to tell your Member of Parliament about it. We're also battling on the scripture classes. We want to keep scripture in the schools. And the Labor and the Greens are trying to push the ethics classes to push scripture out of the schools. That's a special issue I did on that topic. And we're having a big battle. There's a, I was able to get the government to agree to an inquiry 
into the ethics course by Parliament, so that inquiry is being held right now. But we need to get people to write submissions to that committee saying, I want SREE, that's Special Religious Education Scripture, and I don't want this atheistic ethics course in the school. And I, we have to get everybody saying that, and, and the committee gets those submissions, and they, I hopefully they'll make that decision and recommend the ethics course be stopped. Because it is a disgrace in our Christian society that there are now some thousands of children being indoctrinated with atheism in our schools. That's all those classes do. The people who run them say, we're not here to teach the children what's right and what's wrong. They tell the children they can do anything. Nothing is right, nothing is wrong. There's no absolutes. They don't say to the children, you can't steal. They say there may be circumstances when you should steal. So you can shoplift. Maybe some, some occasion, perhaps you might have to kill somebody. Depends on the circumstances. It's called situation ethics or relativism. It comes straight out of hell. As I said in the Bible, when people did what they thought was right in their own eyes, not the eyes of the Lord, but in their own eyes. Now we actually have a course in our schools teaching that to some thousands of children who I see as vulnerable, innocent children being brainwashed, indoctrinated, and the worst thing is when those children, those children grow up, they could be the next persecutors of the church. Those children are so indoctrinated against the Christian faith that there's no God, there are no absolute values, they will become our new enemies. And we don't want any more enemies. we are enough. That's what worries me. Somebody said, well, don't worry, for there's only a few thousand children. I said, what about the duty of care? We're Christians. We have a spiritual responsibility for the souls of those children who are now going to those ethics the classes sent there by their parents but they couldn't go there if they weren't if the course wasn't there so i just pray you'll help me in getting that ethics course completely uh scrapped repealed but you probably saw the herald there's been great big ugly cartoons of me uh making out like i'm a dictator trying to run the state and tell people what they should do but as i said in the beginning i want to be faithful to the word of god and i'll say that no matter what happens to me, or what criticism I get, or attacks I get, I must be faithful to the Lord. So I thank you for letting me share with you tonight, and I just pray that each one of you will be faithful to the Lord. But you can't be faithful unless you know him. And the first thing is to accept Christ as your saviour. I was trying to think of how it works. Like I think God has in our hearts a God empty space, a God-shaped space. And when people say, I never feel really contented, I never feel really satisfied. So they try to find it through drugs or alcohol or sex or something because that space can't be filled with alcohol or drugs. We fill with God, with God's Holy Spirit through Christ. Amen. So that's what we have to do. And once you make that step, the next step is then to put your life under God's control, under new management. Not just to go to church on Sundays but to serve the Lord seven days a week. Be one of his frontline soldiers, whether you're a man or a woman, to serve the Lord in whatever way he wants you to do it, like Gary's done it all his life, and I know others here have done it as well. He has a purpose. We're not identical. We don't all have the same ministry. Each of us has a, a, a different ministries that God gives to us. The main thing is to do what God wants you to do with all your heart, mind and soul. So God bless you tonight. Thank you for having me here.